All right, part two trauma, just following up where I um, left off. So image critique, you are going to use your same image critique as you would for any of your routine radiographs. Um, image quality is critical for accurate diagnosis. So um, just because the patient is fractured or their bones are in a different sort of setup, you're still going to evaluate your images the same as normal, okay? Trauma terminology, just for review, you guys know these by now, but dislocation, subluxation, sprain, contusion, type of fractures. Um, definitely know your type of fractures for boards. So having um, some, one, some of these on an index card or a picture of each on an index card would be uh, a recommendation for board review. Trauma protocols per facility. So each facility are going to have different protocols. Routinely for us at our clinical site, it's normally just a chest possibly a pelvis, um, but technically routine protocols or protocols in the past were a chest x-ray, supine, pelvis, and a cross-table lateral cervical spine. The cross-table lateral C-spine is usually replaced for us. They go right to CAT scan for a cervical spine and head CT, um, but rural hospitals, you might do these routinely portably, so it might be something you need to do. So these are basic um, screenings for major in injuries in certain trauma areas, but chest, okay, they're going to look for um, the same as any other chest, right? So general survey of the chest is if they're supine. Obviously, if they want to look for air fluid levels, they have to be um, either upright or you have to do a dorsal decubitus to show air fluid levels. So if the neck is not clear, they can't sit them up. Your trauma AP chest. So we have that nice trauma stretcher that has the open slot and um, we can just slide it right underneath. So you're going to use your same centering um, as you would for your portable chest or your upright chest. Same thing, right? Watch out for the arms. Try and move any artifacts that you would find. Watch out for necklaces under the C collar um, that they might not have taken off because they can't see it. Um, and then make sure you, you raise that tube up, get the SID that you can. If the stretcher is bumped up really high, you may have to drop the stretcher to try and get that maximum SID. Um, so this is an image example of a gunshot. There's some artifacts in the chest here, but you guys know how to center a chest x-ray. Flail chest. Uh, just a reminder on this one, we've gone over this one before, but two or more rib fractures next to each other with two or more breaks per rib. So it's usually from blunt injury to the chest. Um, it can lead to death depending on how severe it is. Uh, it's one of the worst injuries. So this is a pretty severe one with all of the hardware in here. RIF ribs. Bony pelvis. So pelvic fractures have a high risk of hemorrhage, so they need to pay close attention to that patient for any status changes. Always obtain help for um, if you have to place that imaging plate underneath them or transfer to the table. So watch that patient, monitor that patient. Same centering for pelvis on, you know, just because they're trauma and you don't change your centering at all. Some visual signs that I look for anytime a patient comes in with a pelvis order. Usually the lower limb that's affected is externally rotated and shorter than the other. So if you're working with me and I have a patient that comes in for a pelvis, I kind of flip the sheet up by their feet and look at their feet um, to kind of see if that telltale sign is there. Just trying to watch the arms, um, keep them out of the way, try and get them up. If you need to use sponges to help support those arms, you can. Um, so try and get your entire pelvis on and watch those femoral necks. All right. Okay. So obvious separation there. Lateral C-spine. Cross table lateral, right? Obviously I'm not going to be sitting up. So same centering. It's a C4, right? Top of the cassette here is just above the ear. If you're in the trauma room and they need one, which I would say I have never done one, well, 
probably maybe when I was a student, I did one, but in a lot of years, we haven't done one. So if you have to do a shoot through C-spine, you're most likely going to be in the room. You're going to use the wall bucky, but if not, you would just um, either have a cassette holder or have someone hold the cassette and shoot across. Same SID, same central ray, same image evaluation. Okay. Swimmers, you guys know how to do a swimmers. It can be, you can do a cross table swimmers the same way. Okay. Really similar. C71, arm closest to the image receptor. It's moved. Okay. AP axial cervical spine. So if you have to um, do it on a patient with a C collar, they'll be supine. You're going to put it right underneath them. You would angle the same as if they were upright. If they have a neck collar on and their chin is dropped down lower, you're, you're going to want to do closer to that 20 degree angle than the 15. Watch your grid cassette. If you have a grid cassette under the patient, you want to make sure that it's not at a different angle. So you can sometimes play with the stretcher to get it lined up, okay? So really similar. Uh, your textbook reviews trauma C-spine obliques, which I have never done, but in rural hospitals where they don't have CT scanners, um, they may have asked you to do this in the past. But so same concept, right? Instead of the patient rotating 45 degrees, you're going to have to bring your tube over here and angle your central ray at a 45 degree angle. Um, and this way, and also keep your angle 15 to 20 degrees cephalat. So you're going to have to oblique it and angle it. I would highly suggest a uh, no grid on this one because you're just going to get grid lines all over the place. Yeah. Um, so just a tabletop cassette. They are angling 45 and cephalat at the same time. I highly doubt you will ever see this done uh, in your time, but... Just a fun fact. T and L spine trauma. Uh, basic, guys. You guys know how to center for AP, T and L. Same central rays. The only thing I don't like about this picture is obviously you will not use a cassette without a grid on it for an AP, T spine or an AP lumbar spine. Yours will have a grid cassette. All right. Cross table. Same thing. Same thing if they're lateral on your table. You're going to do a cross table lateral centering in the same place, right, for T and for L. Try and get those arms up and out of the way. Okay. Horizontal beam. You guys will use the wall bucky if you ever have to do that. We won't do this in our room. Abdomen and pelvis. A lot of times looking for foreign body. You guys know how to do a KUB. KUB on the stretcher, same thing as KUB on the table. Upper and lower limbs. All right, so... You want to ideally do this as a team effort here. So if you have two of you, one person supports the body part and one person places the cassette or the sponge or whatever you're doing. So injured limbs, you want to be lifted, support it, you know, above and below the both joints. And then you only have to lift enough to get your cassette under. As always, you want two projections 90 degrees from each other. So an AP and a lateral, right, or PA and a lateral, whatever you have to do. Don't attempt to rotate severely injured limbs for your true positions. You want to utilize tube angles if that arises, okay? So long bones require demonstration of adjacent joints. So if you have a forearm, you have to get the elbow and the wrist. You have to get both joints, joints above and below. Say um, if you're doing a tib fib and um, you clip off the knee, you're going to have to do separate projections if necessary. Just as normal, right? You want to make sure you get it all on. Um, they're utilizing a sponge and doing a cross table lateral forearm instead of having that patient move that's severely injured. Utilizing your wedge sponge and angling for the foot is another possibility. We've gone over stretcher feet um, and you guys will do your stretcher foot comps as well. So we've talked about cross table laterals and angling options for your oblique foot. Um, try and matching up to your patient. So this patient is at a oblique angle, but they're utilizing their tube to show a demonstration of a lateral wrist here. They're utilizing sponges underneath the cassette and sponge in between the patient 
and um, the body part here. This is a nice step wedge sponge. It's really nice. I don't think we have that, but <laughs> that's just another demonstration here too. And when they're casted, they may be difficult because um, a way the way that the elbow is lo kind of locked in place here. So don't be afraid to sort of think out of the box. Utilize, work with what you got, right? Sponges, whatnots. Um, you may have to sit the patient up. You may have to lay them down, depending on what you need. Uh, trauma elbow views. There are a couple in your textbook, but this one is demonstrating a PA versus an AP. So this patient um, might not be able to manipulate into an AP elbow. So they are doing a cross table PA. This is a demonstration of um, a cross table lateral of the distal end of the humerus and lateral elbow. This patient um, is locked in place here with this post reduction most likely, but they're trying to get a lateral elbow. Can you see the tube angle here? They have a tube angle because their cassette and body part are at an angle like this. So they're trying to match that to get their lateral. So humerus, review those el that elbow anatomy for me. We have um, trauma elbow views, so a partial AP or partial flexion AP. So you're going to want to do one with the humerus parallel and one with the forearm parallel. So this is the humerus parallel to the IR. The patient may need a support sponge, depending on if they can't open their arm. Um, I find sometimes allowing them to stand up a little bit makes this a lot easier for them to do. If the patient can barely open this up, you may need to angle into the joint a little bit to be able to get this. And you'll see the humerus looks normal, but the forearm is distorted. Why? Because of this OID, right? It's magnified. OID equals magnification, right? This is the second version, so the forearm is now parallel. You can see the forearm looks normal, but humerus is distorted. The humerus has increased OID, which causes magnification. So you're getting your radiologist an AP, but you're just cutting it into two parts. Acute flexion elbows, I've never done one of these, but uh, they're in your textbook. So it's when the elbow is flexed more than 90 degrees. Coil method elbow trauma views. Um, so lateral for the coronoid process, elbow flexed 80 degrees, and the tube is angled 45 degrees distally from the shoulder. So the tube's coming in here and kind of throwing it this way onto your plate. So 80 degree flexion is usually the key term I find with these questions. And that's what it'll look like there. And this one is for the radial head. And the elbow is flexed 90 degrees. The tube angle is 45 degrees proximal, so toward the shoulder. So it's coming in this way for the radial head. And that's a demonstration of that there. Okay. So fractured elbow or dislocated elbow, fractured coronoid here. And then I think I'm going to stop there and I'll meet you back for pelvis views, okay?